Patrick Clark, the man accused of killing Migos rapper Takeoff, has recently been indicted on a murder charge. So the natural question that emerges is if this case makes it to trial, does he have a realistic shot of being found not guilty? And so just last week, his case went before a grand jury and they returned an indictment against Patrick Clark, finding that there's probable cause that he murdered Takeoff. When a person is charged with a felony, they have a constitutional right to what's called a probable cause hearing. Now in some jurisdictions, it's called a preliminary hearing or a prelim for short, putting you up on some attorney lingo. And in other jurisdictions, it's called a grand jury. Now, they both function differently, but ultimately have the same purpose. And the purpose of the probable cause hearing is for the government to show that there is at least some evidence of you having committed the crime that you're being charged with. Because let's face it, felonies are a serious matter versus misdemeanors. It's a very serious issue. Issue. So basically the constitutional right is that before you're held to answer to go to trial on a felony case, the government at least has to put evidence to show that a crime has been committed. That's number one. And number two, that you are the person that committed that crime. And so in the law, we have something called the standard of proof. And basically the standard of proof is the amount of evidence that's necessary in order to prove a claim. And in a criminal jury, trial. So in a criminal trial, the standard of proof is proof beyond a reasonable doubt, right? And that's the highest standard that we have under the law. But when it comes to a probable cause hearing, the standard is probable cause. So that's one of the lower. So reasonable suspicion is going to be the lowest, but uh, probable cause is just above that. And it's very low. It's just basically reason to believe that a crime has been committed. And so if the DA can establish that there's just reason to believe that a crime has been committed, then the person's going to be held to answer to those charges. If they can't meet that minimal standard, and sometimes that does happen, then the judge has the discretion to dismiss um, the whole case or individual charges, because oftentimes people are not just charged with one sole count. Oftentimes you may have two, three, five, you know, some people up to 20 counts. And so the judge, if he finds that there is not even probable cause or reason to believe that the person committed a particular crime, then he can dismiss any of the those charges. So Clark's lawyer came out giving a statement after her client was indicted, basically saying that, hey, this was to be expected. This is nothing new. And the reality is at the end of the day, there was just no way the grand jury was not going to return an indictment. I mean, you have a person who lost their life in takeoff and there was at least some evidence that Clark was the shooter. So no matter what, you know, they were ultimately going to return an indictment. But again, we we're talking about that that lower standard of proof in terms of reason to believe that a crime has been committed and Clark was the person who committed that crime. But when we're talking about a trial, now we're talking about that high burden of proof, right? Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And so the lawyer came out and said, hey, we expect that the jury will come back with a verdict of not guilty. And you know, that's a pretty bold thing to come out and say, I tend to be a lot more conservative when I'm giving any statements to the press as it relates to any of my cases, just because, you know, I don't believe in making these grand um, sweeping statements because you just, you know, there's probably still ongoing investigation going on. Um, you know, there may be additional witnesses that need to be spoken to, perhaps new evidence that can emerge. You definitely don't harm your client in any way by merely stating that, you know, he has constitutional rights, he's innocent until proven guilty, and we're confident in our defense or, or anything, you know, short of necessarily guaranteeing a not guilty verdict. Everybody has their own style. But, you know, the reason, again, going back to him being indicted is, hey, if you fire a gun, right, which Patrick Clark is alleged to have done, and the bullet ends up hitting someone and that person dies as a result, then there's at least going to be probable cause or reason to believe that a crime was committed and the shooter is the one that committed the crime. But again, just because a person is held to answer to charges at trial doesn't necessarily mean that the prosecutor is going to be able to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The defense that naturally emerges in this case, and I haven't seen too much from the defense side in this, is going to
to be self-defense. And reason being is because there is another shooter who is said to have been involved. You know, if you know the basic facts of the case, apparently Quavo had gotten into it with a couple of guys. Uh, there were, you know, dice being shot. So a dice game is going on. Arguments start emerging about a basketball game or something like that. And then from there, a physical altercation takes place. So a fight breaks out. And then there are two men who are seen having guns. And one of those is Patrick Clark. And so there was surveillance video that ultimately captured Clark. He had a wine bottle in one hand and then ended up pulling out a handgun with the other. He ends up firing multiple rounds. And so after the shots take place, he's seen going to the House of Blues. So he goes over to the House of Blues and the police end up going to the House of Blues afterwards and they find the same wine bottle that was in his hand during the shooting. And the way that we're able to match the wine bottle to Clark is they lifted the fingerprints and were able to match to Clark, right? So that's how they have him as established as a shooter. And based on the angle where he and the other guy who had a gun, um, were positioned, the forensic team has opined that Clark, it, it could only have been Clark that shot takeoff, right? So it's not gonna have been neither the other shooter or anyone else. They ultimately concluded that it was Clark. And in these type of cases where you have just random acts of violence pop out of nowhere, security camera footage can be a key element to the investigation because a lot of times, you know, people aren't going to be willing to come out and give statements. A lot of times they're gonna fear for their safety. They just don't wanna talk. And so if you can come up with security camera footage, then that can be a very helpful piece. I mean, sometimes there will be people who are willing to come out and give statements, but there's not gonna be anything better than actual security camera footage. And so police oftentimes will go to the surrounding businesses just to see if any of them have security cameras that are actually operational and if they were angled in a position to have caught any of the incident having taken place. So apparently they got this one that shows Clark shooting and shows him with this wine bottle and going over to the House of Blues. So with it having been established that Patrick Clark is the shooter, and again, I'm just going off of the information that's publicly available at this point, the question will be how could Patrick Clark, if he goes to trial, somehow be found not guilty for having murdered takeoff? And so it goes back to this thought of self-defense, right? If you are in a situation where you feel there is imminent danger of great bodily injury or death, then you are able to respond with force or even deadly force if you feel like your life is at stake. And you know, this occurred in Texas. And so there's no better place, right? There's no better place to be in a position where you're trying to argue self-defense, especially with a firearm than Texas. I mean, it just is a gun-friendly um, self-defense state, you know, as compared to some more liberal jurisdictions where it's not looked upon so favorably, but in this situation, um, if, if Patrick Clark is asserting self-defense, then you would think that would probably be that in response to the other individual pulling out a gun, he then pulled out his gun and fired his weapon. And so if that's believed, right? So he would have to take the stand if he goes to trial and wants to argue self-defense because he has to uh, demonstrate what his state of mind was and what caused him to believe that his life was in danger such that he needed to fire in self-defense, right? And so if the other individual did pull out their gun first, and especially if they shot first, then he is going to have a strong argument for self-defense. I would say even if the other individual did not pull out their gun first, but something was communicated to him that his life was in danger or he felt like he was going to be physically attacked, he then still might have 
a reasonable position that he was acting in self-defense. But that's okay if we're talking about him firing his weapon at the person that was, you know, being aggressive towards him. But what happens when there's an innocent third party bystander who ends up getting shot, like in this situation, right? So if, through all witness accounts and video evidence that exists, it doesn't appear that takeoff had anything to do with what was going on. He was merely an unfortunate, innocent bystander who ends up getting shot as a result of this exchange. In that situation, and I was doing a little bit of research because this is a relatively rare issue. I've handled plenty of cases where my clients were acting in self-defense. I've handled cases where my clients actually shot somebody in self-defense, but I've never had a situation in my career where someone was acting in self-defense and ended up shooting or hitting in an innocent bystander. And so in this situation, it appears that the issue before the jury is going to be well, they're first going to have to establish or, or find that he was acting in self-defense. And if they find that he was acting in self-defense, the next question will be, was he acting recklessly when he ended up firing his weapon? If he was not acting recklessly, then arguably he would not be guilty of murder. So there's gonna be a reckless standard there and what that ultimately is going to be is gonna be for the lawyers to ultimately argue, you know, obviously, the the prosecution would be arguing that you know he was acting recklessly when he was firing his weapon or they may even argue that he wasn't acting in self-defense or that he was mistaken that he had the ability to act in self-defense in that position but then the defense is obviously going to be arguing that he was acting in self-defense and that his firing of the weapon was not reckless at all and and obviously this issue is going to have to be handled you know, carefully you know you want to be respectful to to the victim here, take off and his family and everything, but the position would be that, hey, you know, my client was acting in self-defense. He felt in fear for his life and felt he had no other choice but to defend himself by firing his weapon. And, you know, I don't know how many shots were fired, but the lesser amount of shots that were fired and depending in the manner in which he fired his gun, then the stronger the argument's gonna be that he was not acting recklessly. He was merely acting to defend himself. Well, so the other question that emerges is, can this case resolve short of going to trial? You know, 90 plus percent of cases resolve via some some sort of plea deal. So, you know, in this type of case, the district attorney is not going to come out and make an offer. This is one of the cases where the defense has to come to the table with a settlement offer to the district attorney. And I would say in this situation, if the defense presents a very credible position that Patrick Clark was acting in self-defense and his actions were not reckless, then the district attorney will really have to strongly consider the possibility that if they put this case in front of a jury, that they could find him not guilty of murder. And so if that's the case, then we're no longer talking about a 25 to life case, right? And I don't know what the um, the sentence for murder is in Texas. In California, it would be 25 to life. I would imagine, you know, in Texas, it's gonna be, you know, some higher number to life. But again, if there's a viable self-defense theory, then, you know, then the possibility is that maybe it comes down to a manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, or, or some or some other negligent homicide that's not gonna necessarily be worth 25 to life. It might come down to say seven years or 10 years or even five years. So in that situation, then negotiations are gonna be based on a much lower number and maybe a deal gets done. But depending on how strong the defense feels about their position, they may not be willing to negotiate for anything. They just may be demanding that the district attorney dismiss this case. And yeah, I mean, if, and if they feel like their client was legitimately acting in self-defense, was not acting recklessly, then a dismissal of the murder charge should be the result. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this one will play out, but those are some of the issues that both the defense and the DA will be dealing with as they analyze this case and prepare for trial. So if you got something out of this, please show me some love and hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on those notifications so you never miss a new video when it drops. As always, I wanna thank you so much for watching and until next time, peace.